Welcome to Rendiard. Today's guest is Mark Griffin, the director of Lawrence After Arabia. Today we are with the director Mark Griffin uh, of Lawrence After Arabia. How are you, Mark? I'm doing great. It's great to be here, Mark. Thank you. Um, I wanted to catch up with you and basically introduce you to the Rendiard subscribers and um, go over your film uh, your film history, your influences, things that have led uh, towards development of your latest feature film, Lawrence After Arabia. Um, the film began as a radio play and then turned into a script. Was there a time in between that period of writing it and turning writing the radio play and then turning it into a script? Was there anything that actually you know, led to that decision to turn it into a movie and lead it away from radio? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I, I'd originally, uh, I'd never written for radio. I'd written some plays before. Uh, but I'd fancied doing, I thought, I'd, I'd written two pieces, actually. One, one was about the last, um, the death of um, Shakespeare. You know, I lived in Warwickshire, so uh, one radio play was about, about his last days. Um, and uh, I'd also, for years, I mean, I, it, this goes back to when I was a child, I'd been um, absolutely obsessed with Lawrence uh, T. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. So I, um, I I wrote it as a radio play. Then, as I as I sort of kept sort of revising it, I realised that it that um, uh, it, it had a very filmic quality, if you like. And yeah. I have quite a cinematic view when I when I write. Um, you, you know, I've written some some novels, and we can talk about that a little later. But when I write, I tend to see what I'm writing. As a, as a as a a scene from a play a from okay. a film, and as I w when I was writing the radio play, I suddenly realised this this had a lot more p potential to be a film. Um, so I think I I very very quickly kind of went no let's let's put some more effort into this, and I it it grew and grew uh, into a screenplay. Um, and I started putting pieces together of what I wanted to show. And, and I mean, the key story about Lawrence After Arabia is really um, uh, how Lawrence as a character was, uh, a, was an agitator. And um, if he was murdered, why would you want to murder him? Um, right. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's how it grew into a screenplay. Um, okay. And, and, and you, you've had a, a, a real kind of connection with 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 Lawrence uh, as a character, as a, as a person. Yes. Um, since, since childhood, um, since visiting his uh, cemetery, and um, is is this something that has always just stuck with you, and you felt that you needed to explore, or have other things interwoven themselves? You know, I, I'm just guessing, you know, watching movies at the cinema when you were growing up as a child and then coming to the realization maybe in later life, hey, why don't I try to explore this? And, and why did he die? And, you know, mm, what, mm. What, what, what can I, you know, add to this story to, to bring it to everybody's consciousness in today's yeah. society? Well, I, 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 as you said, I, I, the whole story started when uh, I was about 10 years old and I went into the church. He, he's got this uh, effigy, which is like a medieval uh, statue, if you yeah. like. Uh, which, which they, they like they, it's, it's in St. Martin's, uh, St. Martin's in the Wall in Wareham. And okay. this, this whole thing was, uh, it's life size and it's, it's what you would see on top of a how you would imagine seeing a a medieval effigy on top of a, a tomb in, yeah. a, in a church, and okay. um, so uh, it was carved by his friend Eric Kennington, uh, oh, who did a lot of lot of drawings uh, of him. And uh, after his death, this thing uh, was supposed to go to Westminster Abbey and St Paul's, and it 
Salisbury Cathedral, Winchester, and eventually ended up in this little church uh, right. in, in this market town, very close to where he lived. Okay. And it's absolutely perfect because it's an old Saxon church, and Lawrence would have loved it. But it's very much a case of the church not really wanting to have this in. Anyway, I, I went in yeah, there. Yeah, there was a bit uh, of a, a, a non appreciation at the time. It yeah, was correct. But I, I went in there when I was about age 10 and I started talking to the guy who was polishing it, um, you know, like the curator or curate of the church or whatever. And yeah. uh, I, I talked, talked about his life and uh, that was the thing that kicked me off. He, and he said this very enigmatic phrase I always remember, which was not all accidents are accidental. And he obviously believed that Lawrence was, uh, was assassinated. Uh, and it's a very, very polarizing subject did in, that in kind music. of understanding flash in your mind as a 10 year old or were you just like well at the time, at the time it was uh uh i you know i i kind of got i'd heard about lawrence but i didn't know enough about him uh and, and look Luckily, my uh, grandparents were very supportive, and they took me to his grave and took me to the where he lived to Clouds Hill and uh, all the the Lawrence sites. And I started reading avidly, and um, because the way I am, I started to become a a bit of a, a Lawrence expert. So you know, I picked up books, and I, I'm you know by the time I was in my twenties, I must have had about twenty books on Lawrence, which I'd read cover to cover over and over again. And uh, as, um, you know, I started started writing and I'd started to think I need to, to, to look more about uh, his death because his death is an interesting story. No, You know, his biographer didn't want to look at it. And um, Jeremy right. Wilson, who wrote his biography uh, in 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 that book, simply says, uh, and he died, he died in a motorcycle crash. That's it. You know, they, they didn't That's go anywhere else. <laughs> no, no, I said, right. I, I, I need to I need to look at this a lot more. Uh, so, as I said, started I wrote a, a radio play, and eventually yeah. that turned into a screenplay. And I, I think it took about ten years to get to the point where I went, okay, this is ready to to be filmed. And at the time, of course, all the ideas were who was going to direct it, who would buy. It. You know, the the original oh, okay. idea was send the screenplay off to production companies and get a yeah. production company to pick it up. That was that was where I was going. So who who did you envision as the director before yourself, if if anyone? Yeah. I I actually one of one of my favourite director actors. I'm I'm very keen on actor directors and Kenneth Branagh. Okay. Yeah, Kenneth yeah. Branagh was the guy yeah. that that I went. He would like this. And yeah, um, I managed to I managed to get the script to him, and he okay. he wrote a nice little letter basically well a little note back and basically said well thank you very much interesting story but you know production diary is full i think at the time he was just right. about to kick off direction on thor or something oh, um wow. and, so and he's that kind of time frame okay that's correct, correct. Can see that, yeah. so i i don't know i i um uh I, i'm trying to remember when this was it must have been about 2011 2012 yeah, i yeah. Uh, um, printed the screenplay as a little A5 book uh, and that, that I found very easy to hand out to people. So I send it off to, oh, crikey, 60 production companies, you know, the usual suspects, Universal, Sony, Paramount, Amblin, you know, anybody I could, I could think of, Tig, as Kevin Costner. Well, uh, I know I sent it, I think I sent it to George Miller. Um, I mean, it was, um, all told, it was a... Um, you know, I sent it to an awful lot of people, and uh, it, it was funny the reaction. I, I I can split the reaction to three types. One was no response whatsoever. Yeah. Two was uh, a um, uh, the reaction from what I call the mainstream. You know, the the Paramounts, the Universal, which was don't ever send us an unsolicited script ever again. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm cool. I'm cool. Okay, okay. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, uh, what I call the British production companies, the the small um, people like well, Renaissance, Kenneth Branagh, um, Sprague, Stephen Fry, 
um I, I got little notes back which was well thank you very much it looks interesting you know hey, how do you, you... you got a reply That's... yeah very positive but nothing uh you know the 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 answer was very much it looks interesting but not sure it's it's for us or not sure we um uh we, we can fit it into our production schedule so um um i, I think i I waited, I think it was about 18 months to two years after I sent those out to basically say, right, I'm not going to get any more reactions back here. Okay. okay. So how do we proceed? So this must have been about 2014, uh, 2013, something like that. Yeah, I know that the time frame that you've held on just creating this and bringing it to, to, to film has been a very long process. What was your experience of you know, uh, what was your experience of moving towards raising production, uh, the funds to produce the film and get it off the ground? How did you go about that? Did you have any current experience or was it a kind of trial by fire? You just, you know, start researching and move forward. How did that work for you? Well, I, 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 I'd done theatre work before. Um, so I, I sort of thought, how would this work as a theatre piece and started to apply some of my, I mean, my background is project management. So a okay. lot of what I do is, is thinking about resources and costs and all of those things. Um, so I, uh, started to think, you know, how much would, well, I mean, to, to be quite honest, the first decision, and I think it was around 2003. 13 14 was okay i'm not going to get more any more positive answers on this nobody wants to make it but i i've put so much energy into this i think it's important it's made this story needs to be told and that was often the reaction i would get from you know the people that i shared it with you know friends and and uh, you know dorset people so um that's what i decided to do you know i said we'll make it now at the time i had no idea whether I would direct it myself, but I said, no, I know, you know, let's, let's put together a plan to make the film. And, um, I, uh, you know, you, you chop it up and you say, right, well, there's this scene to, to shoot. We need this location and, uh, these, these actors. And we, I started to essentially create this huge plan of how much the movie would cost. And I think I, I, the right. original budget I had was about a hundred thousand pounds. I said, that's yeah. how much, I'm prepared to spend on it if I can raise those those funds. Yeah. Um, now, I um, again, the, 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 I mean, the first the first idea was to try, uh, you know, the Kickstarter route, um, sponsorship, that sort of stuff, and I raised tiny amounts of money. I mean, I'm a unknown und unknown director, unknown act, uh, you know, un unknown film maker well so, that's, that's incredibly common on kickstarter it's yeah, like 90 yeah. percent of the people out there it's a passion project most of the time yes how, how did you find so that? you know i raised well it, it was um uh i think on kickstarter had we i think i set a target of 10 grand and the 10 okay. grand was just to do pre-production <clears throat> maybe have a little bit more left over uh yeah. well the it raised i think just over five thousand um and some people sent me the money anyway even though we didn't reach our target um and uh by that time i'd already begun pre-production um which was i think 2017 18 and uh i got to the point where i had uh, a plan i'd started to get the cast together i'd started to get a crew and uh, the budget was starting to solidify, and this this number of a hundred thousand was going up and down a little bit, but you know within the bounds. It wasn't. It wasn't. Okay. You know, it, I'm I'm very much pragmatic, and the way I, I've often been is, you know, if you're doing a, a certain project, you you know, whether it's building a house or doing an IT project or whatever, you're often yeah. in a situation where you have to. Yeah. If, if somebody had said, you know, uh, you've got you know a budget of a million i mean maybe there's a whole different you know i'd have perhaps employed a director and but a lot of the time it was okay 
I can't afford to have a, a costume designer or I can't afford right. to uh, to have an assistant director. So I'm going to have to do a lot of this myself. So you see some of the um, the credits in the film, uh, you know, we uh, my wife and I made props. I designed yeah. the sets. Um, you know, I created the original music for the soundtrack, which Clifford used as a... Um, as a template and we used we had to use at the time for the trailers okay. so a lot of it was um you know having to do it myself because of necessity there was no there was no money to pay anybody else so uh, that's where we got it so just to kind of summarize that without you giving it an actual financial amount what percentage if any um of the overall production would you say was from your own pocket 95 percent Ninety-five oh, percent. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, there was. Very, I, I mean, I I yeah. could have gone. Um, you know, I'd got a um, a consulting company, yeah. uh, and <laughs> essentially what I did was for two or three years, um, the money there, there was a there was money from that from the work that I did that I basically said, okay, you know, um, we paid off our mortgage anyway. And, you know, we were that sort of time of life that we said, okay, well, I'm, I'm going to start putting savings away. So I'd already got this idea in my mind of about a hundred thousand. So that's what I did. I put, I think over, over two or three years, I put away about 80, 90,000 pounds to pay for the yes. project. And, and that's yeah. where we were. Wow. So, it seems uh, to be, yeah, it seems to be the case that many other directors that Randy had works with, 90% are self-funded until they move into their second or third film. Then they're able to raise equity capital from private investors. Um, because without having something to show, it's very hard to get people to back you financially, unfortunately. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, you've you've written books, um, and you wrote a book. Uh, I think the first book you wrote was uh, was about the musician Van Gelis. Yeah, no, that yeah, that goes that goes back a fair way, back back to the nineties. Yeah, I wrote a, a biography <laughs> called Van Gelis, the Unknown Man. It's I think it's still the only biography there is um and you know it um it it kind of what do they say sells steadily uh it's ready i think for a fourth edition i think it the first edition was self-published the second was lulu so okay. lulu you can yeah. do print by uh by you know you can print five one however many so yeah, you know I'm just keep <clears throat> yeah. um but on on the back of that I started writing novels um, mm. uh, and um, um, so I think I've written five novels now and uh, again one of the things I noted when I was writing the novels was the chapters tended, tended to be constructed in my head very filmically. It was almost as yeah. if I was watching a scene from a movie and then writing it down. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's a couple of the books that... Uh, uh, might one day end up as a movie, so we'll see. There is that, yeah. Now that you understand the craft, as it were, yes. and you've actually yeah. got your feet wet, um, you never know. You may step back to some of that material and uh, you know bring it forward as as, as your next project. Correct. Um, so you've you've also actually written an album. Uh, music wise, you, you've yeah. had, you've got quite a bit of experience and. Um, how, how have you found that your music has influenced the film? You seem a very visual-based person. So yeah. acoustically, has that also had an influence? Yeah, I, I um, uh, back back in about 2011, I, I'd been playing, experimenting with synthesizers and um, yeah. various musical instruments. Uh, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't describe myself by any means as a musician, um, but I created an album called Eclectic, which is kind of yeah. a mix of Vangelis and, and Tangerine Dream and, you know, bits of Alan Parsons and very, very uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, eclectic. Yeah. Um, and um, when I was making the movie, one of the first pieces I wrote 
uh, uh, put together was uh, the original uh, opening closing titles. And I wanted this piece of very, very mysterious music. Now, I'd convinced myself very early on that it wasn't it wasn't quite right. It wasn't good enough. Um, but um, interestingly, it did get used in the movie as part of the inquest scene because uh, I'd I'd I felt that it needed quite a very very professional touch. So I handed over uh, the uh, the soundtrack to to a guy called Clifford White who who uh, it's done some fantastic electronic yes. uh, symphonic music. Um, and Clifford's done a fantastic job. But before Clifford came on board, I we needed music for the trailers. So there were two or three trailers came out where I wrote the music. And then when Clifford came on board, I handed over the music and said, well, this is yeah. what I kind of thought we could use. And sometimes Clifford went, oh, yeah, yeah, well, we'll I can yeah. do something with that or threw it away way completely so um um it, it, yeah, yeah so uh, eclectic um still carries on and gives me a few pennies every month from streaming but um uh, <laughs> yeah. another way. spotify has a lot to live up to yes yes correct so, so uh, yeah that's that's where the soundtrack started that's brilliant so i mean over say a 20 year time frame you've you've written you've written a number of books you've composed and, and released an album would you say that finally, just to end the kind of production side of the question, uh, do you feel that the royalties from those creative endeavors have helped to finance this film or were they just very subjective? And very, very subjective. Uh, and no, I, I wouldn't say. What, what they have done is they've given me the confidence to, um, to first of all, hone the craft of writing i think of all the the pieces of the the, the um the movie the screenplay is very strong and it's it's won um you know uh, i think three or four awards at uh, yes. the in, independent film festivals so it's honed my writing and it was the you know it's it's all down to for me a good film is based on a fantastic screenplay and i, I feel the screenplay is very strong for lawrence excellent the film has gained a, a large amount of awards uh, from the festival circuit. Yeah, yeah. Um, how have you found the kind of response and the, the way the audience have, have interacted and, 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 you know, discussed this film amongst themselves? Um, during the festival circuit, uh, internationally, yeah um i think i think first first of all um the there are certain festivals that really locked on to the to this movie um right. you know they, they there was there was obviously a comparison in some cases there was a comparison being made between the david lean lawrence of arabia uh, yes. and this on this movie um i mean it's funny the reviews that we get um we're currently what 7.1 7.2 on imdb and there's a it's a marmite it's almost a marmite movie you either love it or you hate it and if you hate it you know it really gets it gets you know it gets a bit of a panning uh but you know if you look on imdb there are you know half a, de a dozen really bad you know very at some point personal attacks <laughs> which are no, no holding back yeah uh and and you kind of think well i think you you know you need to have a little bit more experience in making your own movies be before you oh. start making you know, those those sort of criticisms but on the other hand the you know there are the 30 you know absolutely incredible um reviews no, we i mean we did the premiere and we had a fantastic review from the uh the, the paper yeah, what you've achieved with the film and, and, and self-production and the release of the film and its success internationally, uh, just, you know, currently on, on festival screenings has been absolutely outstanding. I know yeah. that um, you've had a great response with UK cinema screenings since the lockdown's been lifted. Can you tell us a little bit about why you've 
chosen to screen in cinemas instead of just jumping straight to digital. Yeah. Um, why, why did you decide to wait and yeah. keep the film um, off, off the internet, as it were? Yeah, good question. Well, the film, the film was, was um, ready for release. I think it was the very, the very beginning of 2020. And we'd yeah. planned a premiere on the 19th of May. 2020 and of course we all got coveted and we got pushed back and pushed back and yes. the con there was conversations between i would say the the main cast and the crew to say so what do we think do we just hang on do we wait for the uh, for for the theatrical release and right. uh, and that was that was you know the decision unanimous let's wait and give it a proper send off because everybody had worked so hard on it um uh so we pushed the uh, premiere back originally to october 2020 and then eventually i think we pushed it to march 2021 and eventually of course we got the october 9th premiere lighthouse pool which is f fantastic amazing yeah um, the, the, event the premiere looked brilliant i had a oh, that. Oh, amazing uh, so yeah 700 700 seats sold out brilliant yeah. um it was um and it was a great send off for the film because um, the the other thing about it is the the film is the uh, the story is very personal, if you like, to Dorset. The, the that oh. county, everybody yeah, okay. feels that Lawrence is a a son of Dorset. I mean, he's actually sort of born in Wales from an Irish family, so he's uh, he's got quite a, a colourful background. Yeah. Uh, but he's um, uh, it's very personal to Dorset, so. Many of the screenings I did, tw I think it was 28 or 29 screenings of which eight of them were outside. Yeah, outside Dorset. Okay. Uh, now, all the ones I did in Dorset pretty much were sold out. You know, so um, there's a theatre called the Christchurch Regent, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, seats 450. Sold out. Uh, so wow. it was amazing. I just wanted to ask um, a question that I'm sure a lot of filmmakers uh, would have regarding showing their films in independent cinemas. Can you give any advice how to approach um, e either an independent or a, a recognized cinema chain? How do you get them to actually screen your film? And um, do they just say, oh, you've got one evening or do they offer you a number of dates? How does it work? Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, the first of all, first, first of all, the key thing was publicity, making sure everybody knew. So we did a lot of work getting, getting, getting the word out. In terms of, um, in terms of getting it to the chains, that was nigh impossible, absolutely right. impossible, yeah. um, because the chains, most of the chains are owned by distribution and pub, uh, production companies, and they're showing their own movies. Yeah. So I um, and a lot of the the cinemas. If I'd have gone to the independents and said, uh, "Will you show my movie on a on a split basis?" The, usually the the split is sixty forty sixty to the cinema forty to the distributor uh, to, to well to the distributor the filmmaker. Um, the the they would have gone. Mm, not sure about this. Um, mm, uh, w w no, we, we True, but you have we, an yeah, yeah. Now you could, yeah. but you can hire the screen. So yeah, yeah. I, I did it in plenty of time, and most of the time I was hiring, I was hiring venues uh, um, at about uh, four hundred pounds a night, okay. uh, four hundred pounds a, a, a screening, and saying, right, I need to to, to sell tickets at ten pounds, and I need to, you know, yeah. um, fill it. Boom. Bums on seats as it's many as possible. So again, Correct. incredibly uh, entrepreneurial of you, and it seems that you've got this kind of vision of, of self, you know, finding the audience, getting the foot traffic. You've had radio interviews on uh, the BBC in England. Uh, I think you've had some television interviews as well. So you've yeah, really, really yeah. been working as hard as you can, which is fantastic. And another reason why I wanted to interview you. Yeah. I mean, my my long term view uh, of the movie is I'm going to have to keep working 
at the same intensity to sell this movie probably for at least the next 12 months. I've got to make sure it's on all the streaming platforms we can get it on. I yeah. need to do I'm, – I'm doing another – so we did a, a screening tour of, what, 29, 28, 29 dates uh, back in October. I'm doing another one at the end of January, eight dates in Dorset. Most of those, funnily enough, are uh, – um, venue that well there are three or four venues where they've actually invited us or invited okay. us back um, um uh, and um i'm going to do another one in may which would be uh, is usually the anniversary of lawrence's death on the 19th of may um and we're going to do a big date at the uh, tank museum which is kind of where he was he was stationed for a while um so um uh, I've you've got I've got to keep bringing in the revenue now at the moment with the uh, HMRC BFI funding the 20 percent funding that you get on production costs plus right. the revenue I think we've bought in roughly 45 to 50 percent with merchandise that was we do a little bit of merchandise as well we've we've yes. paid uh, around about 50 percent of the movie cost that's awesome. Uh, on a so, hundred thousand production. 100, well, hundred and twenty. The final, the final production cost was one hundred and twenty-two thousand. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we've we've done about fifty percent. Um, streaming will give us a bit more. DVD release will give us a bit more. Another tour will give us a bit more. So, I'm hoping that tail end of the year we'll have paid for the movie which would be grand and then no, that's um, amazing in, in, a, in, a, in less than a 12 month time frame you've you've really you know bitten very deep into paying yourself oh. back which is brilliant yeah well yeah. done <laughs> i think i want to i want to you know pick up on your point i i get the same thing from a lot of filmmakers they think that you just give it to the distributor once you've got distribution distribution of some yeah. type or other once you give the it Hollywood. to them it's, right i'm on to my next project um but no no i i think you've got to you have to um you have to own it be passionate about it and keep keep pushing it um yeah, uh, and, and there's a few filmmakers i know who do that and they they do an awesome awesome job of of doing that so um um yeah yeah we'll work hard to own your project yeah work hard to own your project exactly obviously as a filmmaker you've been influenced by other filmmakers other films is are there any people director wise that have had an influence on you and and the way you decided to style your movie well the the guy that i mean the one of the key players in the in the production of this movie is about a guy, a guy called simon lawrence who's absolutely no relation but simon i yeah. met oh about uh i think it was 2016 and we, he was uh he was a photographer but also worked on uh, some TV programs, things like Top Gear and um, okay. uh, um, uh, some some of those type um, uh, factual programs, and uh, he was very keen on the story, and we hit it off. We really, uh, you know, got on well. And at the time, I still wasn't. I I, I was kind of, you know, how are we going to make this movie? And right. he was the guy that actually said, "Well, why don't you direct it?" And I went. What me? <laughs> <laughs> I'd done theatre play direction, but I'd never yeah. done uh, film direction. So this is going to be. And when, as we got talking, he said, "Well, you know, you know the story, you know how it works, you know what you want to see, um, and essentially, what I'm going to do is be your technical eyes and okay. say, well, no, if we shoot it like that." it's going to look terrible but if we shoot it like this it's going to look really good so you know he was he was my you know he was my mentor for a good while all the way through the film pointing me in the right direction in more ways than one so no, someone 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 was fantastic um and i mean the members of the crew uh, the the same a tiny tiny crew but they were all people that um uh were you know would pick up a boom mic or you know go make tea or do you know everybody mucked in um to, to this tiny crew um how, how did you go about finding your 
how did you attract your crew? Uh, was it just it was it was a bit out? like the it was a bit like the Magnificent Seven, I think. You know, Magnificent Five. Simon Simon uh, came on board. Um, his son Jack had done mm. some done quite a bit of work. He, uh, for example, uh, designed the posters. A, a very sort of eclectic guy. He helped with sound uh, and lighting setup. Um, I'd done some lighting as well and sound work, of course. So that mm. helped. Um, the uh hair and makeup I, there was a story in the um the paper about about the the film that we were about to make it and i got a call out of the blue from kirsten sayre who was a hair and makeup worked on broad church and she okay. said love to work on the film she came on board um um jenny veal who did the uh, wardrobe was local and i i called her out of the blue i was sort of a friend of a friend of a friend said have you talked to jenny about this so i called jenny and she said oh yeah i'd love to work on this so the crew That's came nice. together quite nicely um yeah and, once you've got the glue then you're going to attract everybody around it yeah there were a few there were a few people that wanted to come on board but I was a little concerned that they weren't, they were doing it more out of um, being on a film project than right. interested in the story. You know, when I, I, I did originally search for a director uh, way back when to work with Simon, and I was going to just act as a producer, if you like. But the, the only directors I could find who wanted to work with it were, you know, their f previous experience was slasher flicks and <laughs> zombie movies. <laughs> <like, "Nah, nah." laughs> so, yeah, I think, you know, taking on was a big, was a risk, but I think, you know, it was the right decision. It was it a good decision. Had a, yeah, it could have had a completely different... Uh, Look, take couldn't. With one of yeah. those directors. Um, so you, 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 you've got your crew and now you've got to get your actors. How did yeah. you go about attracting the actors? Did you just send everybody a script? There's, there's a site called Mandy. There's, Mandy. Uh, there, there, was, there was kind of, I called it, I called it my, my football league. And I had a Premier League and I'd already yeah. realised that there were various parts in the movie that were what I would call cameo. Oops, sorry about that. There were there were various uh, parts in the movie, movie who were cameo that were just one day's filming, yeah. and so I decided I wanted um, certain actors, and I think any filmmaker uh, will tell you that um, they'll they'll come up with their dream cast. You know, yes. oh, we'll get Mark Ruffalo to do this, and uh, now of course I I was exactly the same, and um, I got certain actors uh, in my in that pool of dream cast that I said, yeah, he'd worked very well. I mean, Hugh Fraser uh, and Michael Maloney were both in that pool. And uh, I thought, um, uh, and essentially what you do is you contact their agent, you know, yes. point, you know, a lot of people will try and find out what their personal email is or, you know, connect <laughs> to Facebook. So, um, yeah, you, you essentially contact their agent. The first question the agent will ask is, is this fully funded? That's, that's right. the question. Yeah, is, is there money behind funded? this? Will my actor... And most of the agents... Yeah, well, and most of the agents will also say, um, uh, it, because you are... Um, um, because you are unknown, and yes. quite rightly, and we've only got your word that it's fully funded. We want our actor to be paid up front. Oh, so before wow. they step before they step onto the onto the, the 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 location, you know, you've got to pay pay the actor and and you know usually a proportion of the expenses. Uh, luckily, I'd only got um, well, um, I'd only really got four or five actors who um, I you know I'd. I'd um, um, who were what I call Premier League, who, yeah. I, you know, and I trusted. You know, once you've got the agents involved, the agents are very, very supportive. Um, and Hugh Fraser, Michael Maloney, Nicole and Nicole and sorry, Cox. Nicole was very excited because she'd never made a movie in England before. So she she was, uh, she, she, she was fully on board. We were, we were all, uh, shoot was all complete by 
June 2019. So uh, all done in the city. So yeah, usually having to pay actors up front. Yeah. yeah. Um, then I had, the other thing I did was I wanted actors who were local to Dorset. And there's two reasons yes. for that. One, normally you don't have to pay accommodation for them because they live locally. Two, yeah. I wanted that sort of accent to run through the film, if you like. That's and three, there was there's a huge pool of brilliant actors. If you've seen movies like uh, Rachel or Ammonite, there's a lot of Dorset okay. actors in that in that that film. Um, yeah. And it, so I I managed to find a um, a Dorset talent agent. Um, oh, okay. and, uh, that she she basically helped me to get most of the 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 key actors uh, in the movie. Then uh, I also contacted Equity and they helped. So in the end, the the whole team came together quite well. That's brilliant. And on on a sort of average average daily kind of time frame, how many days shooting was it from you know beginning to end of movie? Or did you come back to it? It was a 20, yeah, pretty much a 20 day shoot. No, no, 20, 20 day shoot. Uh, but we did it differently, yeah. We chopped it up because um, <laughs> Simon and I were both, uh, you know, just clocking on 60. We kind of went, you know, there's no way we're going to. We're going to survive a six-week shoot. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, we'll be, uh, we'll need a, we'll need a, you know, cardiac arrest unit on site. So uh, we, um, what we did was, um, what we did was, uh, we chopped it up into four weeks. So we did okay. a, a week in October. We did a studio shoot in March. We did a, a, another week in May and another week in June. And when okay. we did the main June shoots, we said, right, one of those weekends or one of the weekends was going to be what I call a big shoot. So uh, I think it was uh, May was the inquest. So you're talking 60 extras. And, yeah, um, yeah. and then we did the funeral shoot, another 60, 70 extras with, uh, you know, 15 key characters as well. So that was a big weekend. Brilliant. And and that's how we chopped it up, um, okay. and yeah, managed to ma managed to film it. I think I think we've we actually did eighteen. We did an ADR um, on a couple on a couple of scenes, um, but most of what you hear uh, is the original sound that we we recorded at the time on the on the on the scene. And we we had a rule of three takes as well. Right, we, we used. The Clint Eastwood three take rule. So uh, three Did you takes. Allow and... for any kind of spontaneity with the actors, where they could just uh, you know, yeah. a little bit. And... Yeah, there was a, there was a couple of a couple of actors which um, uh, Tom Barber Duffy, for example, and and um, uh, Steve T uh, um, uh, and um, sorry Steve Rollins, who plays Terrell, the bad guy. They have a very uh, relaxed acting style, and often. Uh, they're not following my script uh, to the letter. And, and I kind of, you know, there were occasions when I went, oh, no, I'm sorry, you've got to... You, yeah, yeah, to, to the letter. Um, uh, but most, most of the time, most of the time it was, it, it was, it was pretty good. Um, my, my direction is light, lightweight anyway. So, uh, but I mean, in terms of, in terms of, there, there's a couple of, lines in the movie that's an homage to um to the original movie the david lean version so uh okay. the, there was um david he likes Lee. lemonade we use that one but yeah oh, there's no. a couple a couple of lines that are an homage to david lean and i mean i love david lean's work my i mean my favorite director is ridley scott so he he's just awesome oh, okay. absolutely all awesome. right how did you get brian cox in ah movie? right uh well brian yeah. i um when we had, um, first of all, Brian is married to Nicole. Now, okay. it's a kind of one of these uh, synchronicity things. I knew Nicole Ansari as an actress. I mean, knew of her. I lived okay. in Germany for years, and she was in a TV uh, series over there called Tatort. And right. she was fantastic and really intense. And funny enough, when I started to cast Sarah Lawrence... I uh, wanted that sort of intensity 
Um, so I, she was the top of my list and I approached her and she, I was so surprised. She went bit my arm off because she really wanted to make a movie in England. So I said, yeah. right, okay, well, you know, and, and she was um, part of the, the October shoot, October, 2018. So one of the first scenes we shot was with Nicole. Now, we filmed in an old house, um, not far from uh, well, well, on the on the Isle of Quebec, and um, she arrived the night before, and she arrived very early. So we basically put her in a taxi, and she got shown Dorset. So we kind of really looked after her, and no, uh, yeah. you know, gave her gave her dinner, looked after her, and then she had a great day. She really enjoyed it and kind of left it she could have left by lunchtime because we'd finished shooting um nice. but she stayed right to the end of the day we put her in a taxi got her back to the oh i took her back to the station uh in my car and i asked at the time um you know is um do you think your brian your husband suddenly realized uh after i'd taken nicole on as the actress for Sarah, that of course she was married to Brian Cox, so one of my favourite actors. I saw him years ago in Hamlet, playing playing uh, Hamlet's Hamlet's ghost, um, and uh, said, um, "Yeah, well, would Brian uh, do this?" And and she kind of went, "Well, he's very busy, um, but yeah. I'll ask him. I'll ask him. But you know, you'll need to go through the the agent anyway." Yeah. I went the through the agent channels. of official <laughs> channels. And he, she said, well, mm, voiceover, yeah, shouldn't be a problem, um, but um, it's going to be short notice. And I think about three weeks later, I got a call from the agent and said, look, if you can be in London on Tuesday, the 10th of November um, in Primrose Hill with a studio, he's got two hours. Wow. Oh. Wow, and and that was it. <laughs> the train. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, for the... the, the uh, you know, finding a studio, the first thing I went to was studio Primrose Hill. Uh, oh, all right. So, uh, yeah, luckily there, there is a studio in Primrose Hill. We hired it for a few hours and Brian came down, lovely guy. There's a couple awesome. of photos we took um, and uh, we did it. He's, he's a lo lovely actor to work with. How do you feel about the digital distribution landscape um, with all the, 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 the current changes that are occurring? Yeah. I think I think it's fair to say that, like technology, it's very very difficult to keep up with what's what's been going on. Um, you know, when I started the movie, you know, three years ago, I kind of had a clear idea of where I wanted it to go in terms of the what I call the digital distribution. <laughs> but all of that changed very very quickly, and certainly um, affected by COVID. Um, you know the payback from people like netflix and you know some companies are um you know with music distribution it's the same the payback is peanuts so yeah. the first thing the first thing i i kind of realized was that the physical distribution was going to be very important in terms of the payback of the movie so i wanted a company um who understood digital and and that's what i got when you know when we spoke the fact that you could you had lots of ways to go and that you knew the different markets and you could yeah. say well okay if i want to get this this the film to this market this is how i need to press their buttons and and yeah, frankly yeah. Uh, yeah that that's that's why that's why we you know that's why we came to you because we thought um, you knew those those markets, and you know, obviously, yeah, now we're I mean, on Amazon. We, and that, that's been proved, so it's, yeah, it's now, great. So now, now the film's just gone live on Amazon, uh, yeah. UK for England, and dot com for America. It's available in Germany, and, Germany, uh, France, yeah, France. Um, yeah. Well, we did. That's another. Germany actually, Europe. that's another point. That was one of the conversations we had, which was um, subtitles. It, you know, I, I mean, having lived in France and Germany, France won't watch a movie in English. They'll want to see the subtitle. Yeah. Uh, or uh, in Germany, it'll be dubbed. So, you know, we've prepared the uh, the the, the M&E file so that you could dub it if you wanted to. So, yeah, we've got Dutch, German, French, Spanish and, and English subtitles. Oh, yeah, it's in Spain. For the hard of hearing, yeah. So that's very important to do, I think.
Well, yeah, it was a it was a dodgy moment. The, you know, the fact is that we back in what February twenty twenty, uh, I was booking screen the screening tour those th- those twenty eight twenty nine dates. Uh, ready for May 2020 and of course it all got pushed back so we we changed it three times and and um at the time I thought oh my god you know am I actually going to sell tickets you know are people going to going to watch it so that's why I was very keen not to release on digital until we'd done the the cinema tour um and uh, yeah I, I kind of I I found it quite interesting because there was a was it universal it was a bit of a backlash against universal when they started to release movies like trolls i think it was that was the first yeah, movie Tro- trolls 2 was the first yeah. one that came out but it was a really rocky time i i just kind of watched it like a slow motion car accident yeah it's interesting i, I mean my the, the 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 lawrence film in terms of a product if you like it's a it's a movie that is, that is very attractive to people who like period movies. Period movies tend to be liked by by people who are over forty that like the sort of the the Jane Austen, Charles Dickens that sort of look of movie, and and that's what Lawrence After Abia is. So I the feedback that I've been getting, which is why the the, the cinema tours were and are being so popular is that the people of that age still want to go to the movies, uh, oh, yeah. still want to see it in a cinema. Um, yeah. And yes, they, you know, I, they, they, I've done a lot of work to get the link out for Amazon and, and to, so people can watch it uh, through streaming. But uh, I'm still getting people <laughs> saying, oh, well, you know, we'd rather see it in the cinema. Uh, you know, oh, is, I mean, yeah. is it coming to Yorkshire at some time? You go, oh, well, you know. Yeah, if you go to... Uh, easy to remember, Lawrence After Arabia, www.lawrenceafterarabia.co.uk events, okay. forward slash events. events, or click on events, and you get the uh, the ticket links down there. That's so, uh, really yeah. good. So um, for, for the viewers and listeners of, uh, of, of this Randy Yard interview with Mark Griffin, um, Mark's movie, Lawrence After Arabia, can be found um, in the description. There'll be a direct link to the film on Amazon.com, uh, so it's international. But we'll also leave the UK link as well. And I'd just like to thank you, Mark. Um, it's been really fascinating. Pleasure. Uh, I wish you every success with the movie, and uh, you know, hopefully, we'll be able to work together in the future on whatever you choose to do next. No worries. Thank you very much, Mark. Pleasure. If you enjoyed this interview, please like and subscribe. If you would like to be featured on the Rendiard interviews, please go to our website and send us an email. If you would like to submit your film to Rendiard for distribution, please go to our website at www.renderyard.com. Click the Submit Film tab, enter your film details, and we will review your film and get back to you.